Hi, I'm Phil Cook, and I'm really excited about the podcast today because I'm going to be interviewing Philip Yancey. We've been friends for a number of years. Now, let me give you some numbers. Phil has written about two dozen books. He sold 17 million copies worldwide. He's written the book of the year twice in a row. I'm going to tell you something. If you're creative in any way, shape, or form, whatever you do, filmmaker, designer, writer, whatever, you're going to want to listen to this because we're going to talk about his new memoir called Where the Light Fell. It's his life story, and it's fascinating, and I want to talk to him about how he came to write it, what went into the writing of it, so if you want to tell your story ever, this is going to be a time to listen, because you're going to learn some things that are going to really help you tell your story more effectively, certainly in a way that could impact the world. All right, Philip, thank you so much for being a part of the podcast. We've been friends for a long time, and you've been incredibly gracious to me. I've, I've, I know you get probably hundreds of emails every day asking you questions, and you've been incredibly gracious to answer mine over the years. And so I'm thrilled to have you on here because we have so many creatives that follow this podcast. And the minute I read the memoir, Where the Light Fell, uh, which I think is just fantastic, um, I knew that there are people that need to know about this. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how it came to be. And so I'm thrilled to jump in there and just start with this thing. Does that sound okay? Let's do it. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you this. At what point, let's go back a little bit. At what point in your career did you decide writing was the way to go? It was my first job. I was in graduate school at Wheaton, and I had always taken courses in communications and writing and literature and things like that, but I, ne I needed a job to uh, pay tuition bills. So Back in those days, there were a lot of Christian organizations that were located in Wheaton, Illinois. Most yep. of them have seen the right, the light now and have moved to Colorado. But <laughs> in those yeah. days, they were in true in you know frosty Wheaton. And uh, the only one that offered me a job was a magazine called Campus Life. Yep. And they figured if if we have that in our name, there should be somebody on a campus. So. I, they said, why don't you be our stringer? You can tell us what's really going on. What This is the 1960s or early 70s, and there was a lot happening on campus. So they said, you can be our campus reporter. And there eventually go. I got a full-time job, became the editor, and, and in time became the publisher. But that was a great starting job for me because I learned how to write on the job. I yep. had some, a wise editor there who made me redo everything about 20 times. And... I also had a very intolerant audience. There, there is no group harder to write for than teenagers. They won't take any stuff off of you. And if you don't keep them going in a magazine, you're out of a job. You know, you got to get them to read the next sentence, the next paragraph, the next page. So that was uh, an important learning experience that the, the writer is not in charge. The reader is in charge. And if you're not giving them something that rewards the experience of reading, then uh, you're out of there. Well, you know, one of the things I've heard you say is you always encourage creative people to start working for somebody first rather than immediately launching into a freelance career. What? Tell, tell me, explain that to me. Right. It's, it's just so hard as a freelancer. You've got nobody to share the burden with or to collaborate with. We, uh, I started uh, as a writer, but there were two or three other writers on staff and we would just laboriously go over each other's material. And, yep. and that taught me and it also protected me so I wouldn't launch out on my own like that. And after eight years, I decided I need to go freelance. And frankly, it, it took me about six months to get used to the new pattern because when I worked for a company, I never questioned, am I earning my salary? Absolutely, I did. I moved, I moved in those days papers from the inbox to the outbox. That's what we did. And as long as my outbox was full at the end of the day, I, I earned my salary. Absolutely. I've got a title on the door. You know, I know where I am. When you're a freelancer, you've got to define your own identity every True. day. And, and a lot of those days, at the end of it, you wonder, did I do anything worthwhile? I mean, I may spend three months on something that ends up in the trash can. It often yeah. happens. So there's no way to just validate yourself without a lot of... Uh, uh, support from other people or that's or, good or maybe yeah maybe you have a legacy from your a trust fund from your parents or something or a patron <laughs> but most of us don't <laughs> yeah 
Well, you know, I, I, I had a very similar experience. I, when I was, my first job was working for what at that time was the largest media ministry in the country. And um, it was easy for me to transition from full time to freelance because I got fired. So it was a fairly easy, tra- yeah, it was, the decision was made for me. But what was it in your case that made you decide to go out and launch and become a freelance writer? It was the feeling that I was turning in book manuscripts before they were done before before I could give everything I had to them. So I did my first book, Where Is God When It Hurts? And I wrote that on Saturday mornings. I would bicycle to a pancake house and sit there with a yellow legal pad and write a chapter each week. So 12 weeks, 12 chapters. And and I turned it in and it sold well. And I was getting uh, you know some plaudits for it. So I thought, oh, I should try another book. And I did that. This was uh, fearfully and wonderfully made with Dr. Paul Brand. But when I turned it in, I thought, man, I wish I had another six months and I could go over every word and every sentence and really polish this thing. And I felt so bad about it. I thought I can never do that again. I either need to cut everything else out and devote myself fully to writing or stick with what what, what I'm doing. It's not a weekend pursuit. It's not a hobby. It's got to be a calling. It's got to be a vocation at least. And so I, I liked my job. I liked the people around me. I liked the magazine. But I said, I've, I've, I've got to take that risk. Fortunately, I had a wife who still had a job. And we moved to downtown Chicago just to change our context and to be a little more distant from what I had been doing before. And that was the greatest move I ever made. But it was scary at the time. Well, I, I tell people that getting fired was the best thing that ever happened to me. I think, you know, I... I I should have stepped out long before, and I think God finally fired me. It wasn't my boss that fired me at the time. It was God, because it was. I knew I was called to L.A., but I'm, I'm the, I don't know about you, but I'm the king of rationalization. I can come up with a million reasons. Well, you know, I don't have to live in L.A. to actually work there. You know, we've got good school for our kids, a good church, and our friends are here. I was in the Midwest. But uh, I think God finally just kicked me out of the nest and said, no, it's time to go. So sometimes I guess that happens as well. So let me ask you this. You've done, you, <laughs> you, uh, you've done um, you know, like two dozen books. You've 17 million copies sold. You've had book of the year twice. Um, why at this point in your career did you decide it's time to do the memoir? It's time to write your life story. Why, why now? I've wanted to do it and planned to do it really for at least three decades. It's always been in the back of my mind. So I've been taking notes. I have this massive database of uh, 9,000 entries that I've accumulated over the years. So I wanted to tell my story because I was I was given some extreme things to write about. <laughs> you can't waste that stuff. You know, you can't make it up. And I also wanted to capture the subculture. There are so many people in America, maybe 100 million people, who were at least on the margins of the evangelical slash fundamentalist world. Yeah. So, you know, Billy Graham and, and the explosion after World War II and Young Life and Youth of Christ and summer camps and crew, Campus Crusade, all that, you know, we, that affected a lot of people. You know, we created yeah. a little subculture, a big subculture, yeah. that that had those things in common, that had quite an infrastructure of publishing companies and bookstores yeah. and the film industry and all that. And whenever I read about it in the secular press, they it they seemed tone deaf. They never got it right. They would use words we wouldn't use, and they just didn't they didn't do justice to it. Sure. And I had an unusual viewpoint, uh, because I grew up not just in that subculture, but in Southern narrow-minded fundamentalist uh, hellfire brimstone (laughs) culture, you know, Flannery O'Connor. I've read books like Angela's Ashes that capture the Irish Catholic poverty culture. I've read books like uh, Educated by Tara Westover that captures fundamentalist Mormon or Chaim Potak, who captures the Orthodox Jewish, but I hadn't yeah. found a, something that just explains it from the inside out. And I, I wanted to do that because I I hadn't seen it done before. And at the same time, I had my own story that I'd never told fully that as, as I wrote, I realized that this is a, pe- a prequel. It's a backstory to the other books that I've written because it explains not just what I believe, but why why I'm so obsessed with the same things 
over and over that I, in my writings. You know, I, I've been reading a lot of memoirs lately and about them, uh, you know, from people like Mary Carr and Danny Shapiro and Lee Miller and the Memoir Project. And uh, one of the things that I've, has always baffled me, and I'm going to get down to nitty gritty here, this is a historian question and a memoir question. You know, when, when you're talking about your parents, even before they were married, as a writer, or, or your conversations you had as a kid with your brother Marshall, how do you, you know, what kind of creative license do we have? We can't possibly, you, I mean, if you remember all that verbatim, you're a genius, you're more of a genius than I thought. Um, what do you, you know, how much creative license can we have when we go back and tell those stories as far as our ability to remember what really went on back there? Is that a lot of legitimate question? No, it's a great question. And I, I did face that for sure. Now, I had the advantage of having taken notes since I was a teenager, really. And there are certain things like when your parents are yelling at you about to punish <laughs> you, you don't forget those words. They, they're burned and you remember those. But we would get together in uh, family uh, reunion type things. And I would always have my little stack of three by five note cards in my pocket. And I would listen carefully to everything everybody was saying. And then Brilliant. I, I try to use these mnemonic devices to remember, you know, the first letter of each word. And then I'd run to the bathroom and write them, <laughs> write down the actual <laughs> words. Uh, and I, I spent so much time in the bathroom. I think my family members all thought I had diarrhea because <laughs> oh, I'll be right back. You know, <laughs> and what I was doing was recording the words. Well, later, uh, of course, I didn't have a complete record, but um, when it when it got to the nitty gritty, I also had a writ I had written documents. I had letters from these people, especially my mother and brother. I collected letters that my brother wrote his girlfriends and and their wow. back and forth correspondence. And so I did feel it was legitimate to use that kind of wording, you know, the very same. When I, when you get to the, those really critical comments, if they wrote it, I, I felt it was legitimate to take that and put it in a different context um, in in spoken words. But I I had so much to draw on, and some of that stuff really was burned into my subconscious. I, I I'm bet. pretty pretty confident that this is what happened. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this. Did, did did you ever get into a situation um, with your brother, with classmates, with friends, other people that they remembered it differently than you did and you had a, some conflict there? I haven't heard from that yet. Okay. Um, my brother participated. I, I sent several drafts past him, so anything that didn't sound right to him. He's had a stroke, but he's got very good long-term memory, just not good short-term memory. So... Uh, he, he he's smarter than I am, and he could remember things from five years old, six years old that I had forgotten, or I was a little bit younger than he was. So he was a good source. And I actually interviewed my mother. She knew I was writing a memoir. She knows that. And probably will never read it because she doesn't usually read my stuff. And she has eye problems as well, partial macular degeneration. So she can't really yeah. read a book. But I, I used a original sources as much as possible. And like you, I just drowned myself in memoirs to try to figure out how the genre works, how to put it together, how to construct it. And I, it, it, was, it was tough for me, Phil, because all my books are kind of the same. They're idea-driven personal pilgrimage books, I call them. Yep. You know, so I take one, what is Jesus? Uh, what is grace? Does prayer really work? You know, these kind of basic questions and start just showing how I've come to terms with the conclusions I draw after going to a bunch of experts and trying to figure it out. Yeah. But that, that's an idea outline and that doesn't work. You don't read memoirs for ideas unless you're reading, I don't know, Albert Einstein's memoir or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're reading it for stories. And I had to force myself to think, okay, how, think back behind the summary. Don't just tell me what happened. Give me the scene, paint it for me. And I did have these resources to draw on. And my editor kept prodding, can you make this into dialogue? Can you, <laughs> can you give me more sensory detail? Don't, don't give me these summary sentences about what happened. Just show me, you know, show, don't tell. That's the first rule in writing. So, you know, someone once said that a fiction writer starts with meaning and has to create 
actions and events to make that meaning you know, happen, whereas a memoir person starts with events and has to find the meaning in those events. Is that, is that pretty accurate? Yeah, I would even go further than that, Phil. One thing I learned, I, I didn't know how to write a memoir, so I just started reading for probably yeah. four years. 90% of what I read was a memoir. I made a list of about 300 of them that I had read, and some of them were terrible and some of them were great. But every single book, every single book that I read triggered a memory in me about my own life that I wouldn't have had if I had not read that particular book. Interesting. And, and I realized that when you read a memoir, it's really revealing yourself <laughs> more than it's yeah. revealing the author. Uh, unless you're reading somebody really famous, like a sports figure or a right. president of the United States, there you want to know the facts. But if you're reading my story, for example, Nobody has my story except me. So you're not really reading it to find out every detail of my story, but there's something in there that's going to trigger even before we started this conversation. We were going back and forth on, oh, do you remember? Oh, do you remember? Because you had a similar <laughs> experience growing up in the South, but it wasn't the same. Yep. It was a different group yep. of people. Some of the rules were the same. Some of this crazy stuff was similar. But as you were reading my book, that's what surfaced more than my story. And, and that's what I love about memoirs. They're, they're self-revelatory to the, to the reader. But I, I came across a quote from Walker Percy, and this is about fiction, but it relates to the quote you started with. He said, fiction doesn't tell you what you don't know. It tells you what you know, but don't know that you know. Wow. And I think that's true of memoirs too. You, you're, you're not reading my life to learn data. You're yeah. reading my life because you have a life too. <laughs> and it's going to summon up some memories of that life. And it's and you're going to say, yeah, I went through that too. This is interesting how Philip resolved that. I wonder if I could do that or no, I, I disagree with him. I, I can't go down that route. And, and Interesting. that's what a memoir does. Well, you know, one thing I really liked about the book was uh, Mary Carr once said that don't use jargon in a memoir. And she, she used the example of she wouldn't talk about her mother being, she wouldn't call her mother an alcoholic, but she would show scenes of constantly finding vodka bottles all over the house and pouring them down the drain. It's kind of the, you know, as a, as a film director and a, a producer myself, our, our mantra is to show, don't tell. You know, always show the action. And you did a great job in the book. It's, it's, you're not accusing people. You're just kind of explaining what happened and, and you know, let the reader decide for themselves. And I, I just think that was a powerful, powerful way to do it and I didn't do that in the first draft for sure um, I started out by just recording every single memory I had about every single relative I had and I ended up with a 240,000 word book which would be like <laughs> you know a thousand pages nobody wants That's to read huge. that yeah and so then with some guidance I went back and and cut to the important scenes and I, you don't know in advance to me when I would interview somebody and listen to their story, I knew immediately which scenes were important and which ones weren't. Yeah. But when you're writing your own life, they're all of equal importance. They all happened. You know? <laughs> so I just, I wrote them all down and then had some wise editors who would help me pare them down, mainly by cutting out a lot of fascinating material about my crazy relatives. And they said, yeah, you're right. They're crazy. Yeah, it's fascinating. But this is your memoir. It's not your Uncle Jack's, you know? So That's stick, right stick to you. And, uh, but I, I couldn't do that, that uh, scene business in the first couple of drafts. First, I had to get the events down, all the events. Then I had to pare them down. And then I had the story of what happened. And some memoirs are written in a reflecting old man looks back on life kind of way, where they're just yeah. recording. I just reread a memoir by uh, Malcolm Muggeridge recently. Uh, I love his title, Chronicles of Wasted Time. <laughs> Would anybody <laughs> read this book? You know, what he wrote, <laughs> he, he was working on his third volume when he died, but uh, it, he's just telling you what happened, kind of reflected yeah. and making judgments and, and crass comments about the stupid decisions he made. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted something that showed an emergence, an emerging kid, uh, living in a family that was kind of strange and 
in a really toxic church situation. But of course, the kid doesn't know that. He just thinks this is normal and everybody else is weird. And, and then realizing this church is weird and I got to get out of this place or it's going to beat me down. And, and yeah. so one of the things I decided on, I went back for several times, is I wrote the whole book practically in uh, present tense. Because when I was a kid, I wanted to show that kind of ignorant, scared, fatherless child that I was. And in high school, I wanted that kind of sassy, uh, you can't tell me anything. Um, yeah. And then in college, the cynic, you know, facing the 1960s with its chaos. I wanted to show each one of those phases as they happened, rather than kind of putting them in that, in that uh, flashback potential of uh, I know where I ended up because when you're living, you don't know where you end up. <laughs> That's true. So That's I, true. I wanted to express that as it happened because nobody knows where I'm going as they read the book. And when I was living, I didn't know where I was going either. I wanted to capture that. Well, I like this. I like the suspense because you're right. We didn't know what was coming next. Now, let me, let's talk about motivation for a second. I'm assuming you would advise someone writing their life story that you're not. Don't be motivated by I'm going to set the record straight or I'm going to show you. I mean, it's not about being vindictive or getting your revenge on people. Um, it, it, I mean, tell, talk a little bit about that. The most compelling point of view. Is, is one that seems to you as a writer as a neutral point of view. It, it's very tempting, put in these asides that, that make you think, uh, that make you look like you're smarter than you are or uh, <laughs> making judgments on other people, or in my case, judgments on the church around me. I eventually did, but only after swallowing and trying to toe the party line very comprehensively, and then when I found out that the church had some things deeply wrong, like race, it felt like a betrayal. And if I had just said, you know, this church was a racist church from the beginning, there's no suspense there. I needed to, I needed to show that and that I was one of them. I, I am a racist. I was born and bred a racist. And, and I, I bought, I drank the Kool-Aid <laughs> in those days. Yeah. And then when I found out they were wrong, they lied to me. That was a huge crisis of faith. And, and unless you're honest about that point of view, you know, rather than reflecting back. I remember reading a, a book on history called Practicing History by Barbara Tushman. And she said, um, when you write about World War II, for example, never use a flash forward. For instance, if you're in the Battle of the Bulge, right? it, it looks like Hitler's going to beat you back. It looks like they're going to chase you all the way back to uh, the beaches of Normandy and push you in the ocean. And for and never say, of course, we know how the battle turned out. No, <laughs> you lose all your suspense. You lose all exactly. your attention. Uh, so don't do that. Try to reflect the actual point of view of the person who's living it. You know, it's interesting. Towards the end of the book, I love how you kind of took the tour in the aftermath section. You kind of took the tour of all those places from high school to churches and everywhere. And you even with some people, you kind of you put in their responses to all this. You know, I remember the guys asking you, why do you why do you hate us? Why do you write about us like this? I, I really like the fact that you let them speak. It's not just a one sided story here. You kind of let the other people tell their story. That was that was really an interesting approach. Hmm. Well, I'm glad you like that. You know, we, we toyed about making that into an epilogue or an afterword or something. And, yeah. and the problem I faced is that I've been writing books for 40 years. And if you if you have read those books or some of them, you have this image of me as this, you know, Christianity Today, uh, inner varsity type writer. And, and then you're reading this book about a, a child, a wounded child who becomes a insecure cynic and it's hard to put together and and so I didn't want to I, I ended pretty much in college days with a couple of I continued the relationship with my mother and brother beyond that but pretty much the action takes place up until college and not much beyond that and so there's a gap there now wait a minute now I'm 72 years old I've been I've been in the middle of evangelicalism all these years writing books about my faith, how do you put that together with this emerging person here? And the only way I knew to do it was to, to go back <laughs> to 
to go back yeah. in time to the actual people that I had grown up among, some of whom needed to make reparations to me, <laughs> or at least apologies, yeah. and, and others where I needed to do the repairing, the reconciling. And it because grace has been one of my themes, it was actually important me, to me to do that, to, to see if it worked, if you could put together even the people who hurt you. I mean, Jesus told us, love your enemies. Who who yeah. really does that? Who tries to do that? And it's a it's a hard thing to do. It's but I, I felt I needed to do it to somehow bring the story together as a coherent whole. It's interesting that this is not the first time you've written about your past, you know, and there have been parts of other books and you've, you know, talked a lot about it and and in other books, but you, you must have created a, a long list of critics over the <laughs> over the years for people that really don't like what you do. I, I, I did a search just the other day on you, and I found a few websites that aren't crazy about you. Let me just say that. Um, do you get a lot of hate mail? How do you deal with critics? I, I don't nearly as much now as I did about 20 years ago. If I, really? if I write about Donald Trump, yeah, I will instantly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that happened early in the 2016 campaign, even before he was the Republican nominee, when right. I said something about how could any Christian follow a man like this? And man, I, I knocked Brad and Angelina Jolie off the, uh, off the trending list in That's Facebook funny. that, that day. And, um, so I, I just stay away from politics a lot, but, um, I try to avoid those websites. They they don't do much for you when you sit there reading about how terrible no. you are. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally you'll true. Have to totally send, true. You have to send me a list for someday when I'm struggling <laughs> with pride or something that would bring me oh. right back down to earth. <laughs> well, you know, the other thing too is there are a lot of subjects, a lot of doctrinal issues, for instance, that you really don't talk about a lot, or you don't make a decision. You won't make a decision about. Um, I, I've seen a number of interviews uh, with reporters who say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And you you want commit. And I just, I find that fascinating because we live in this social media age where everybody feels like they have to comment on everything. I mean, my Lord, whether I know anything about it or not, I'm going to say something about it on social media. And I think that's just way down the wrong path. And so I love the fact that there are things that maybe we, it doesn't really help for us to talk about. It doesn't really help for us to express our opinion. Let me say that. It doesn't help for us to be opinionated about certain things. I mean, tell me a little bit about your motivation for that, because I really, I really admire that. Part of it is to follow the example of, say, a C.S. Lewis, who wrote about mere Christianity. He doesn't talk about any theories of the atonement or theories of the second coming of Christ or the millennium, you know, he just says, that's not my province. I'm not an expert there. And none of us know really yeah. on, on what's going to happen in the future. So I'm going to stick with things that the church, broadly speaking, has agreed on the divinity of Christ and, and, you know, how the Old Testament fits together with the new things like that. And I found that so healthy because the churches I grew up in were defined by the margins. You know, <laughs> we, That's true. We, we heard about the Battle of Armageddon every other week or so and hell and all that. And, mm -hmm. and somehow I missed grace. Somehow I missed God's love. And how, how could you do that? But I did. And so I when I started writing, I wanted to stick to those, to the broad sweep. And then there are some specific issues. The gay issue is one where I had a, an experience early on where I was a very good friend of Mel White, who was undeclared as a gay person at the time. He was, he was one of my five best friends. And then he took me out for lunch one time and told me he, a story about himself that had been going on for years and I had no clue about. And he is still my friend. And so I've, like everybody else, have, have struggled with this issue. How do you put it together with Right the traditions out of evangelicalism, and I just decided early on I'm not going to take a stand and declare myself because as soon as you do that, you lose a voice to the other side. You're claimed by one side, and the other side yeah. won't have anything to do with you. They cancel you out. So I have spoken to very conservative groups, and I have spoken to the Gay Christian Network, and tried to find what does the gospel have to say to each of you, you know, and yeah. tailor, tailor my message, but uh, you won't find me saying, this is what I think about the, about the gay marriage issue, for example. I just, 
somebody needs to stand in the middle. And I, I take seriously the, the biblical command to be reconcilers. We are to be reconciled. We have been, and we are to be reconcilers. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't see that the evangelical movement is defined by reconcilers these days. There are a lot of dividers. It's tough. In this, I, I think social media has a lot to do with it. I, like I say, we just can share our opinion about everything, and that's not very helpful sometimes. Um, let's go back to the memoir for a second. Um, hey, since it's come out, um, where the light fell, just for anybody that doesn't have it, you need to get it. Um, since it's come out, have you, have you, how many times have you woken up in the middle of the night thinking, oh my gosh, I forgot about that story. I should have put that in there. Does that happen? Well, considering how many stories I cut out, no, it hasn't <laughs> happened because I put down every one of them in that first draft. And uh, my wife jokes that after I die, she'll use that for her pension fund to just sell off some of those scenes that didn't quite make it in. Um, so let me ask you this. What's next? What are you working on now? What's in the pipe? Well, I'm 72 years old, so I don't have a lot of big books in, ahead of me. I do <laughs> want to write a book on uh, things I've learned about writing. And, oh, that, yeah, uh, it's about time. It's about time. So I'm sure I'll learn a lot in the process of writing that book because I tend to do a lot of research and go to people who know more than I do. And I don't have any firm plans beyond that. Some people say, well, you should do volume two of your memoirs about your life as an adult. But I don't know. That's kind of boring going around being a writer. And, <laughs> you know, as you know, uh, we just sit in a chair and click, make insect clicks on the computer all day, right? <laughs> Absolutely. No big deal. No big deal. Um, so uh, tell us how to find out more. By the way, before I say that, if your website, philipyancy.com, has a ton of writing stuff on it. I mean, there's some really good articles on there about writing, which I, I just encourage people to go, philipyancy.com, check it out, because it has some really good writing stuff and some articles about all kinds of things on there that you've done a great job building some real content in that that's fantastic. What I'm interested in, things I'm thinking about, you can find there. But the website has descriptions of all my books and some of those articles that you mentioned. And and uh, links to interviews and reviews, things like that. Well, I'll say this, once people start reading your books, they tend to get hooked and they, they end up with a whole, I got a stack of your books up, uh, up in my office. So uh, that's just the way it is. Um, let, let me ask you this before we go, is there one thing you'd like to leave people with about the memoir? What's, what did we leave out? What's, what's one thing you'd love for people to know? When I wrote it, if you ask me what my target audience was, I don't think about that usually a lot. I just start writing. I write yeah. for myself, and then I find out who else is interested. And But if, if I had one target audience, you probably know this term, ex-evangelicals. And I've heard there are <laughs> as many as 25 to 30 million wow. ex-evangelicals out there. These are people who maybe have some nostalgic memories of growing up in a church where there was a summer camp or a youth director or, you know, a young life person who they really liked and they went to Bible studies and think, things were really hopping for a while. Then they went to university and they tried some churches and they were just so ornery. They were anti-science, anti-gay, anti-everything. Mm -hmm. And their university professors are saying, don't believe that religious stuff. It's just a bunch of nonsense. And, and so they're, they don't give a lot of thought to it, but they still have these memories. And many of them, I've, when I talk to them, they tell me their stories about why they left the church. And they know I'm a Christian writer. And I usually lean back and say, oh, it's a lot worse than that. Let me tell you, my church. <laughs> and, and they say, wait a minute, I thought you were a Christian writer. I say, well, I am. But it would be a bad trade to trash the whole thing because of the way some people treated you in church. I mean, we have an opportunity to, to connect directly with the God of the universe, the God who, who made this planet. Yes. And, and yeah, I, I got a bad misrepresentation of what that God is like as a dirty bully in the sky, just crushing people. And, and later I learned, no, uh, the title of this book is Where the Light Fell. And that comes from a quote by St. Augustine who said, I could look at the sun directly, but I could look on where the light fell. And for me, I talk about, I, I couldn't look at the sun directly. I've been scorched by that sun because the kind of yeah. sun that, that, that I grew up among, this hell-loving, smashing bully in the sky. And then I found out, no, the message that Jesus brought is the message of a father who was standing on the edge of the porch every day, scanning the horizon, could today be the day my son comes home? And, and I miss that message completely, and a lot of people are. 
and especially in our divided society today, when so much is looked at through the lens of politics, it's it's really easy to miss the core message of the universe, that the heart of yeah. the universe is a smile, not a frown. It's it's God's love, and God expressed that love by creating ornery, very free <laughs> people yeah. like us, so free that we can reject him, we can curse him, and. Yeah. And then he he includes those rejections in the Bible of all things. He tell, he gives yeah. us the words that we can use in Job, Ecclesiastes, all these books. So I I want to speak to that group. And usually when I talk to people, my story is worse. I had more to overcome or for God to overcome, but God yeah. did, and it's it's redemptive. And my brother had a parallel story, but a very different story where he he went through active rejection against everything he was brought up to believe and, and behave. And most of it turned out to be self-destructive. So I'm not preaching. I'm not trying to convert anybody. I'm just telling you the story, but it is a story of hope and redemption. And it can be for other readers in a different place in the journey too. That's fantastic. And I, you know, as you said that, I thought one of the reasons I believe the Bible so strongly is because it's got a lot of jerks in there. I mean, if I was going to write a piece of propaganda, I would never put a lot of those stories in there. I would never, Absolutely. never do it. So it convinces me that this has to be real. Yeah. I mean, the the biggest heroes are Moses, who was a murderer and had an anger problem, and David, who was a murderer and adultery or adulterer, and Peter, yeah. who was just like Judas, betrayed Christ, and, and Saul, who made his living persecuting Christians. These are the heroes, the giants. <laughs> And I think the message is, no matter what you've done, God can find a way. (laughs) That's true. Because if if somehow you use those people, then he can use other jerks like us. (laughs) Well, hey, man, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Uh, Where the Light Fell, I love it. It's a great book. You've done a really tremendous job. And I would love to see the other 500 pages that you uh, edited out. That would be an interesting... (laughs) That'd be an interesting to negotiate ride. with my wife on that. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it. And Janet is going to be tough to negotiate with. She I can will. Tell you that. She will. Oh, man. Well, listen, thank you so much. I appreciate you doing it. I'm incredibly grateful. I think it's going to inspire a lot of people who have you know, wanted to write their, their own story, but just didn't know where to start or how to begin or what to think about. So I'm, I'm so grateful that you come on and do this. And I found it to be a very therapeutic thing. People say, wasn't it hurtful to dig up all those old wounds? And actually it wasn't. It was a way to to shine the light on them and stitch them together and look at them from my adult perspective now. And, and it wasn't traumatic at all. It was very therapeutic. So I hope it is for other people who attempt the same thing. I'm so grateful for Philip to come and do this. He's been a super, super friend for many, many years. I I write to him for advice. I drop him an email every once in a while. I know he gets hundreds a day, but he's been so incredibly gracious to help me answer some questions in my own professional life, my own creative life. So I'm so grateful to Philip. And and remember, get his book, Where the Light Fell. It's a great memoir. If you want to learn to tell your story in some way, whether it's a memoir, whether it's a history, whatever you want to do, this is just a great book. I mean, it's first of all, it's a fantastic story about how he dealt with this fundamental hardcore background growing up and how he kind of pushed away and and created a whole new path writing about the grace of God and what it's like to be a real Christian. But this is a great book for you to get. I'd encourage you to get it today, Where the Light Fell. And again, remember my book, Maximize Your Influence. If you want to learn about digital media and how to get your story out there through digital media, this is the handbook you need to have. And remember, thanks, share this with somebody. If you know a creative person that could learn from it, could benefit from it, I'd encourage you to share it with them because it could be a real blessing and a real help to them. And rate us, give us a rating because that helps us move up in the ratings out there. And subscribe. If you just happen to get this from a friend, subscribe to these podcasts because they're really designed at the intersection of faith, media, and culture. Really designed for creative people. Whatever kind of business path, career you're in, if you're creative, this is a podcast you need to listen to on a regular basis. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode. 